on World News Tonight. COVID rising. Neighboring India continues to report new high numbers of COVID cases in the first few days of 2022. The government moving swiftly to curb the situation. However, officials are warning that the Omicron variant could be a potential threat to the subcontinent. Meanwhile, Europe becomes the epicenter of the pandemic with the EU surpassing 100 million cases. Democracy burning. Large fire tears through South Africa's parliament, collapsing roof and gutting entire floors. The fire broke out on Sunday morning and more than 12 hours later, dozens of firefighters were still working to bring the blaze under control. Sudan in crisis. Sudanese premier resigns amid violent anti-coup protests that have left at least 57 people dead. Tonight, the latest. And legendary white. Remembering an icon that entertained billions across the world. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight as we bring you the latest events from across the world. Our coverage begins tonight from our neighboring India where the new Omicron variant seems to have become a challenge. India reported more than 27,000 new COVID-19 cases with infections sharply rising for a fifth consecutive day. But the chief minister of the capital, New Delhi, said that there was no need to panic, citing low hospitalization rates. The country's largest cities, including Delhi and the financial capital, Mumbai, have been a recent spike in COVID-19 cases, including those of the Omicron variant, which has triggered a fresh wave of infections in the other parts of the world. Unfaced by the rapidly rising cases in India, most of the major cities, including Delhi, Mumbai and Kolkata, saw huge crowds in markets and tourist places. Although the numbers of active cases in Delhi has tripled in just the last three days, the chief minister said that hospitalizations had not gone up. Delhi was amongst the hardest hit cities during the second wave of the pandemic in India last year, with hospitals running out of beds and life-saving oxygen, leaving patients gasping for breath. India is set to launch a vaccination drive for children in age group of 15 to 18 years and state governments were gearing up to administer doses at schools, hospitals and through special camps. Over in Europe, the cumulative COVID-19 cases topped 100 million, accounting for more than a third of the world's total infections. According to a tally, the region has logged nearly 5 million cases over the past week alone, with over a dozen countries reported record numbers over the past days due to the rampant spread of the highly transmissible Omicron variant. Europe's cumulative COVID-19 cases topped 100 million as of Sunday, accounting for more than a third of the world's total infections. According to an AFP tally, the region has logged nearly 5 million cases over the past week alone, with over a dozen countries reporting record numbers over the past days due to the rampant spread of the highly transmissible Omicron variant. France, for example, reported over 20,000 new cases on Saturday, the fourth consecutive day that the country reported a daily tally of over 20,000. It has now become the world's sixth country to report over 10 million cumulative cases since the pandemic broke out. Against this backdrop, the French government has ramped up measures in an effort to curb the spread of the virus in the new year, including limits on gatherings and a ban on food and drink at multi-use facilities. In the UK, secondary school students will have to wear face masks in classrooms once again as the country also faces a surge caused by Omicron. The British government said the measure will be enforced until January 26th when a new set of COVID-19 measures will be announced. It explained this would maximize the number of children in school and the amount of time they spend on school as well. In China, new cases in the lockdown city of Xi'an have fallen to their lowest in a week as its 13 million residents face their 11th day under strict home confinement. 122 new infections were reported on Sunday, a slight drop from the previous day. Meanwhile, Israel is grappling with the spread of Omicron, with around 1.3 million cases documented so far since the onset of the pandemic. Health experts, however, warn between 2 to 4 million people may be infected by the end of January. The warning comes as daily infections have more than quadrupled over the past 10 days. Hoping to contain the spread, Israel has recommended a fourth dose of the COVID-19 vaccine for all citizens over 60, as well as for health workers at least four months after their third jab.
The move is set to receive a final approval by the health ministry in the coming dates. Moving on to the United States, the top infectious disease experts warn that a surge of coronavirus cases could threaten the capacity of the nation's hospital system. The sudden arrival of Omicron has brought record-setting cases counts to countries around the world and dampened New Year festivities across the globe. The U.S. is facing a dangerous surge in hospitalizations due to a wave of new coronavirus cases. That's according to the top U.S. infectious diseases expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who on Sunday told ABC News that even if symptoms of the Omicron variant seem less severe, the sheer numbers created a risk. Even if you have a less of a percentage of severity, when you have multi, multi, multi fold more people getting infected, the net amount is you're still going to get a lot of people that are going to be needing hospitalization. And that's the reason why we're concerned about stressing and straining the hospital system. The sudden arrival of Omicron has brought record-setting case counts to countries around the world and dampened New Year festivities across the globe. According to data from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Omicron variant was estimated to cause almost 60 percent of coronavirus infections circulating in the United States as of December 25th. U.S. authorities registered almost 347,000 new coronavirus cases on Saturday. The U.S. death toll from the pandemic is approaching 830,000, the highest of any country on the planet. Well, this January 6th will mark one year since the U.S. Capitol came under siege and the committee investigating it reveals what former President Donald Trump was doing during the pandemonium. Reports reveal that he was in a position to minimize the damage and turmoil. Trump received heavy criticism from the media upon this revelation. A U.S. congressional probe of the deadly January 6th Capitol riot a year ago is now looking into issuing subpoenas to sitting Republican lawmakers. Democratic Representative Benny Thompson, who chairs the special committee, on Sunday told that his panel was examining whether it could lawfully subpoena current members of Congress. Quote, I think there are some questions of whether we have the authority to do it, Thompson said, according to an interview transcript. We're looking at it. If the authorities are there, there'll be no reluctance on our part. The panel is investigating the day thousands of supporters of former President Donald Trump, egged on by false claims of election fraud, attacked police, vandalized the Capitol, and sent lawmakers and then-Vice President Mike Pence running for their lives. The committee also wants to know what happened inside the White House and is seeking communications between Trump allies in Congress and the former president's staff. Multiple people close to Trump, including conservative media TV hosts, urged him during the riot to make a televised speech telling his supporters to stop the attack. Trump waited hours before releasing a pre-recorded message. The special committee last month sent a letter to Representative Jim Jordan, a Republican and ardent Trump ally, asking for testimony about his telephone conversations with Trump on the day of the riot. Jordan said in a recent Fox News interview that he had, quote, real concerns about the committee's credibility, but was reviewing its letter to him. The committee sent a similar letter to Republican Representative Scott Perry. Perry declined to cooperate, posting on Twitter that the committee, quote, is illegitimate and not duly constituted. An appeals court ruled earlier in 2021 that the committee was legitimate and entitled to see White House records. Trump had tried to shield from public view. There's a new leadership in the EU tonight as France takes over the presidency of the European Union for the next six months. Paris landmarks were lit up in blue and adorned with EU flags in celebration for the start of the presidency. Following that story for us tonight is out there in our world news special correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna standing by in Normandy in France with the latest. Good evening Chetana and Happy New Year to you. Yes, Janali. Wishing you a very Happy New Year as well. Among the various sites cast in blue were the Eiffel Tower, the Arc de Triomphe, the French Senate and the Louvre Museum. However, one of the displays drew criticism from far-right leader Marine Le Pen, who protested against the placing of a European Union flag on Arc de Triomphe, calling it an attack on French identity. Le Pen, who polls shows to be President Emmanuel Macron's main rival for the spring presidential election, was joined by other right-wing politicians in outrage against the EU flag fluttering on the Paris landmark. Le Pen said she would appeal to the Council of State, which acts as a legal advisor of the executive, to remove the EU flag. France last held the presidency 13 years ago under President Nicolas Sarkozy. 
Macron has said France would use the occasion to push the Union to move on topics ranging from post-COVID economic recovery to migration policy and European defence. Back to you, Shanali. Thank you. That was Adha Derana World News Special Correspondent Chetana Dharma Ratna reporting from Normandy in France. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Let's take you straight to Sudan, where the crisis has intensified in the African nation. As its civilian Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdak announced his resignation more than two months after being reinstated as part of a political agreement with the military. Sworn in in August 2019, Abdullah Hamdouk became the first civilian Sudanese prime minister in 30 years. The veteran economist was tasked with leading Sudan's transitional government after the ousting of longtime leader Omar al-Bashir. But all was not smooth sailing. On October 25, 2021, the military seized power, detaining Hamdouk and other members of his cabinet. General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan said he led the coup to prevent civil war, but the power grab sparked weeks of mass protests. Hamdouk was eventually released and reinstated on November 21, but this meant signing a deal with the army. Not long after signing it, Hamdouk said he would quit if the Sudanese people didn't think the agreement served their interests. It called for the release of political prisoners, an investigation into violence during protests and protection of freedom of expression. Members of the Sudanese pro-democracy movement saw the deal as a betrayal and continued to protest the military's involvement in politics. Scores of people have died in crackdowns on the demonstrations. Born in Sudan South in 1956, Hamdouk has had a long career in public service. In the 80s, he worked as a senior official for Sudan's finance ministry before holding a number of leadership roles, like at the African Development Bank and the UN's Economic Commission for Africa. On Sunday morning, South Africans woke up to the newest of its centre for democracy was on fire. Literally, a large fire tore through South Africa's parliament in Cape Town on Sunday, causing the roof of one building to collapse and gutting the chamber of the National Assembly. Images from the scene showed flames shooting out of the top of one building, sending plumes of thick black smoke into the sky above parliament and into neighbouring streets. A fire broke out at the South African Parliament in Cape Town on Sunday, causing extensive damage to the complex. Firefighters tackled the blaze for several hours. By mid-morning, the smoke had started to subside. The disaster came a day after late Archbishop Desmond Tutu's state funeral at St George's Cathedral, a stone's throw away from where the fire happened. President Cyril Ramaphosa said the work of the parliament would carry on. Yesterday was a day crowned with uh, celebration, a day crowned with uh, sending off our beloved Archbishop, and to wake up to the devastating news of the burning down of uh, the National Assembly or Parliament uh, is, is just really a terrible setback to what we were basking in yesterday. An arch would have been devastated as well. He also said he believed one person was being questioned in relation to the fire. No injuries have been reported, according to a government minister. The cause of the blaze was not immediately known. The parliamentary complex, some of which dates back to 1884, consists of a cluster of buildings. According to Jean-Pierre Smith, a Cape Town mayoral committee member, the roof of the old building had collapsed and the fire had gutted the third floor of the building. Which is of concern. He added that the parliament's fire alarm only rang when firefighters were already on site. Lithuania continues to face more crisis with e illegal migrants entering that territory from Belarus. Aside from building a wire fence along the border to prevent the inflow, the government of Belarus has taken separate measures to rid themselves of the migrants that have already entered the country. 
the largest group of migrants who broke through the Lithuanian-Belarusian border at the height of the latest migrant crisis have been returned to Baghdad. 98 Iraqis were promised a one-time payment of 1,000 euros after boarding the flight. According to the Lithuanian Ministry of Internal Affairs, all went voluntarily. Since the beginning of the migration crisis, Vilnius has expelled more than 500 migrants who arrived via Belarus. Over 3,000 remain in Lithuanian refugee centers. We need to start thinking what we're going to do when the term in refugee centers end. We have to talk about integration, otherwise they'll try and reach other European countries. Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, followed by the EU, the US and other Western countries accused the government of Alexander Lukashenko of using illegal migrants to solve political problems. Minsk and Moscow blame Europe for the crisis. According to the Belarusian Red Cross, there are around 600 foreigners still hoping to get into the EU at a holding center near the border. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Let's get you more events in brief from across the globe as we take you around the world in a minute. An outbreak of avian flu has killed more than 5,000 migratory cranes in Israel, prompting authorities to declare a popular nature reserve off limits to visitors and warn for possible egg shortage as poultry birds are culled as a precaution. News of Austin's positive test comes after the Pentagon last week tightened restrictions as its headquarters over concern about the highly transmissible Omicron variant that has led to a sharp increase in COVID-19 infections throughout the world. Twitter Inc. said it permanently banned the personal account of Republican U.S. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene for tweets that repeatedly violated the social media misinformation policy on COVID-19. The EU is planning to label energy for nuclear power and natural gas as green sources of investments despite internal disagreement over whether they truly qualify as sustainable options. Russia has had historically high levels of alcoholism and alcohol-related deaths, which launched a series of campaigns across the country. Northeast of Moscow, residents took part in a novel holiday run on New Year's Day instead of the usual drinking and party. The Marshall Fire has been the most destructive in Colorado's history. The fire is 60% contained as crews continue to search for two missing and families return to see what was left behind. The number of people missing after a wildfire roared through two Colorado towns dropped on Sunday from three to two as authorities announced one person has been located. One of those persons has been accounted for alive and well. So that gentleman is no longer missing. We are still uh, missing a woman from the town of Superior and a man from out by Marshall. Boulder County Sheriff Joe Pelly said the two missing people lived in homes that were consumed by the blaze. The rare urban wildfire erupted Thursday morning on the northern outskirts of the Denver area. Wind gusts topping 100 miles per hour pushed flames eastward into the towns of Superior and Louisville, prompting evacuations. In just two hours, the fire had scorched 6,000 acres, officials said, destroying nearly 1,000 homes. On Sunday, sheriff's deputies were using cadaver dogs going house to house to search for possible victims, while volunteers helped search for missing pets. We're actively working the scenes with dogs. Um, the scenes are still hot. They're still, you know, deep in debris, hot debris, covered with snow. So it's a very difficult task. Despite initial reports that downed power lines started the blaze, Pelley said detectives are still investigating the cause of the fire. U.S. President Joe Biden has declared the scene a national disaster, freeing up federal funds to assist with recovery. Three major powers in Asia are racing towards pace. South Korea, Japan and China are all expected to reach milestones in their space programs this year. South Korea, China and Japan are all aiming for groundbreaking milestones in the space race this year. China's space station Tiangong, translated to Heavenly Palace, is scheduled to reach completion this year. China has been working on the project since the early 90s. It will be the world's only space station in operation should the International Space Station close down in 2024. 
Japan is also set for a first commercial launch of its H-3 rocket this year as well. Mitsubishi Heavy Industries is preparing its launch of the rocket, deemed as one of the world's finest, with communication satellite company Inmarsat as its first user. 2022 will also be a turning point for South Korea's space program. South Korea will start developing its space navigating system, KPS. This project is the largest in Korean space history, with more than 3 billion U.S. dollars put into its 14-year development. The Nuri space rocket is also launching for the second and third time in 2022, once again carrying hopes of progress after its launch in 2021 had partial success. Korean multipurpose satellite 6, or Arirang-6, is also set for launch later in the year to replace its outdated model Arirang-5. Although South Korea has joined the space race later than two other major powers in Asia, its developments are surely gaining momentum. And finally, tonight, comedic actress Betty White, who kept a career for more than eight years by becoming a pop culture icon after Emmy-winning roles on television sitcoms The Golden Girls and The Mary Tyler Moore Show, has died less than three weeks shy of her 100th birthday, People magazine reported Friday. Actress Betty White, whose more than 80-year career included Emmy-winning roles on TV comedies The Golden Girls and The Mary Tyler Moore Show, died Friday less than three weeks shy of her 100th birthday. Her death was first reported by People magazine. In a youth-driven entertainment industry, White was an anomaly as a star in her 60s and a pop culture phenomenon in her 80s and 90s. Playing on her imminent likability, she was still starring in a TV sitcom, Hot in Cleveland, at age 92 until its cancellation in 2014. White said her longevity was a result of good health, good fortune, loving her work, and honesty. I, I've never tried to pretend to be somebody I'm not. Uh, you play roles, of course, as an actress, but as far as with the game shows or the talk shows, if, if you try to be somebody you're not, the audience will pick up on you like that. You can't fool them. Why did they wait to do this till I was 90? <laughs> her ability to get laughs was always at her fingertips, like in 2012 when she unveiled her wax figure at Madame Tussauds. Oh, honey, just snap out of it. <laughs> White, who had no children, was passionate about animals and a champion for them in her charity work. A Reuters Ipsos poll in 2011 found that White, then 89, was the most popular and trusted celebrity in America. In a statement to People magazine, her agent said, quote, Even though Betty was about to be 100, I thought she would live forever. Let's look at the world news tonight for this Monday night. Thank you for taking the time to join us. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're going to leave you with images of Hollywood Boulevard where fans of Betty White has gathered near her star to pay their respects. Thank you for watching. Good night.